The following discussion is not necessarily the views of all involved. The goal is to start open and honest discussion in the Christian worldview. Like all things, weigh what you hear with what you know and join us in our pursuit for the truth. Enjoy the podcast. If you're illiterate and listening to this episode, write in the comments below. (laughs) Nazis are evil. Hot take from Josh. Caleb also thinks Nazis are evil. Colton, however. Okay, why why is it with lambasting me every at the end of every episode? I don't get it. All right, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Second Rate Saints podcast. I'm one of your hosts here, Caleb. To my left is I am Joshua. To my left is. I am Colton, and to my left, it's me, Caleb. We've gone full circle. Sadly, we are missing both Cole and, hang on, question. Joel. Joel, holy moly. <laughs> question, there's three of us. Why, didn't, why did you say full circle and not full triangle? Because it's a really lopsided. It's a three-sided square. Yeah. It's an, it's a, we are a isosceles <laughs> we also, triangle right we now. also lie to people when we say, yeah, like, kinda. to my left, and it's like two people, it's clearly across. Yeah, but you're. I'm to your left. Yeah. Not when it's only Colton's two of us. to my left. Yeah, is he? Yeah. In a triangle, Am somebody to has to be left? straight across. No. He's to my left. You're to my right. This is dumb. <laughs> Agreed. I th- I still am on the, we're on the three-sided square thing. Okay. I mean, with how Colton's sitting, everyone's anyway, in front of him. If you want to <laughs> find other shapes, yes. our website has also shapes and you can find Joel and Cole on there. We have some of their bios, some of articles written by, I think Cole has one. Mm-hmm. Written. I'm not sure if Joel has one on the blog. We'll bully him into it. Mm-hmm. Um, and episodes where they're, where they are uh, there. You can also find a link to our buy me a coffee if you want to support us and you can find a DM chat feature or Ooh. you can email us at uh, second rate saints at gmail.com. Um, speaking of which though, our hundredth episode Mm. is coming up. So what we're doing is we're asking viewers in general, Hey, send us some questions. You can either ask us personally about stuff, about the podcast, anything, Mm -hmm. you know, um, should be a good time, but you can either send that to us on the DM function right on our website, second rate, www.secondratesaints.com or email it in Mm -hmm. with secondratesaints at Mm gmail.com. That being said... Josh. Yes. Do you read? Um, I've been known to in the past. Okay. What have you read? Um, for youth ministry at my church, we did two series of books called Can I Ask That? And Can I Ask That Too? Did you read them with the youth or did you read them for interacting with youth? So we read them and then each of them comes with like a presentation for okay. the, the youth themselves. Um, and it is a series of questions that are often asked by either like Christians that are in youth ministry and growing up, like normal faith formation questions that people worry about, mm-hmm. um, or uh, new Christians. Mm-hmm. And so it's questions like, can I trust the Bible? Does the Bible contradict itself? Can I be a Christian and believe in evolution? Does, the, does God discriminate against women? Is Jesus really the only way to God? Um, and then the second book, it's like, is it wrong to doubt God? Is hell real? How could God send someone there? Can I do something so bad? God won't forgive me. Normal questions that people might just, you know, there, there was a, there's a lot of people on the internet that when you talk to them, they'll be like, you know, I wasn't able to ask questions at my church. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like the, the pastor would either say like, you know, whatever, you just have to have faith, just believe or whatever, or they were shut yep. down. And yep. some churches have been places where that asking questions wasn't healthy. And this was a we did this with the whole youth ministry to basically say like, ask whatever you want. We're, we're ready. We right. might not have an answer, but we will be willing to sit down with you and talk with you and do the best we can. Mm. Um, and these were also great resources. And the book is written by three authors, Jim Candy, Brad M. Griffin and Kara Powell. Um, and they are all, uh, one of them is the executive director of Fuller Youth Institute. Oh, oh really? Yeah. Um, 
How many pages are each of these books? Like they don't look very big. No, they are 200 like pages. 205. Mm. Okay. So and the second one looks a little bit smaller. Yeah. It's like 175. And like approachability is, oh, it's, it's like grade eight. Okay. Right. Like it's, is it meant to be for the youth leaders or for like anyone the, who wants to know these answers? Yeah. So this is the leader's book, okay. but it's, it's formatted like a group discussion. Okay. So it's done. And yeah. Um, what would you say content wise it's largely about? Is it like, here's, here's the question. Here's what we think the answer is in the biblical backing. Or is it more like, here's the question. This is how you might need to approach it. And this is how, like, these are the different arguments for and against it. Yeah. Like, so what, what do you think is more pastoral or it's more apologetic or bi like theological? I don't know. It is multifaceted. So for example, mm. session three is, can I be a Christian and believe in evolution? And so it goes, it has a big idea, which is like two sentences. Um, and then gives instructions of like things you'll need. And then it gives a like real life uh, situation where a kid went through a problem in mm -hmm. their life about like, can I, mm -hmm. like, is this a problem? I'm doubting Christianity because it's not what the Bible says yeah. about creation and stuff like that. What happens if my dad says that dinosaurs and humans existed at the same time? Yeah. Um, and then it's the actual, like some follow-up questions and then there's some scriptural backing and then there's some theological breakdown, um, some more follow-up questions and then a carry through of ideas of various people like C.S. Lewis and other things. And so like, it, okay. it's like a, 10 page breakdown of various means to have the conversation. Interesting. Um, and between the two books, how many like questions do you think? It right is now? it's like 10, right? eight and oh. six. So 14. Okay. Okay. Um, they're very good. Um, you'd recommend them. I would definitely recommend them if you're in youth ministry or you are looking for a quick resource to answer somebody. But you know, if you're, these are not going to satisfy fully probably like a 45 year old intellectual that's coming into Christianity and you're like, and he's, and he's got problems with like, you know, like the, the chapter on does God endorse violence? And mm -hmm. then you use that as a defense for the invasion of Canaan. Like it's not gonna, it's not it's, <laughs> to some people. It's not gonna be fully sufficient because it doesn't cover every single little yeah part of it, but it gives a good overview and a basic but for a 14-year-old who's like, man, I just don't like the way, you know, some of these, like the flood went. Why does God kill everybody? <laughs> yeah. What's up with that? Yeah. And then, like, it'll Fair be questions. satisfying for yeah. that, for that level of answer. So. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, what was it called again? Uh, can I ask that? Eight hard questions about God and faith. A sticky faith curriculum. <laughs> well. By... Uh, Jim Candy, Brad M. Griffin, and Kara Powell. And, and covers. Yep. This is the the most important part. Yeah. So the two in our, in our the audio two covers only podcast. are a like dull burnt yellow, orangey. It's thing. like a mustard yellow. Yeah. And uh like a black. charcoal gray black yeah. um with words <laughs> in negative. Um I give I like the second one better than the first one. Okay. So I will do for the first book a two and for the second one a 2.5. Wow. Okay. That's way lower than I thought you were going to give it. Jeez. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm a four for the black one and a three for the yellow one. Okay. Only because I think the light, the light parts of the words kind of clash with the yellow. Yes. That's about it. That's true. Cool beans. Cool beans. Okay. Yeah. So for those... <laughs> Um, illiterate in our audience who can't read the topic that they clicked on for this episode. We're continuing our acts, our act series. <laughs> so uh, and it Josh, makes sense because they're listening to our podcast because they can't read. And so they need people to speak it. No, nope. they can hear it. No, nope. they can converse. They need to be able English. To speak. Literate people also listen to podcasts. What I'm, you know, I know I, I, you were proposing a hypothetical where somebody who's illiterate decided to click onto our episode, meaning that they clicked onto it because means we got really good graphics. If you're illiterate and listening to this episode, write in the comments below. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait. Uh, <laughs> send us a voice message. <laughs> what? Um, Josh. Yes. What happened in Axe? 
the entire book? No. <laughs> previously. Oh, previously on Acts. Um, we covered chapter 13 and 14, mm. uh, where Barnabas and Saul go off on their first major missions trip to Cyprus, to Antioch and Pisidia, um, Iconium, Lystra, um, and then back to Antioch in Syria. And then they move back to Jerusalem, which is what we're getting to. But during these events, they preach the word to uh, Gentiles and Jews at the synagogue. And Paul presents a masterclass on biblical theology of a Christology and mm-hmm. the redemption of sins through forgiveness and faith. And it's awesome. Right. Um, this is part of his p- first yeah. um, missions work to the Gentiles, which have now mm-hmm. been welcomed into the church. Yeah. And, and sorry, one community after uh, because of their communication style and their um, one talking less and one talking more assumed them to be Zeus and Hermes, mm-hmm. which is a very funny situation. And Paul's and drastically trying to stop them from worshiping barely him. stop them from sacrificing yep. animals oh. to them. Um, it's also, we have now kind of, we're a little bit further into it, but that's also the, the point where Acts shifts from Peter mm-hmm. to Paul. However, the theme going as far back as chapter nine of Stays. what do we do about Gentile believers has been carrying through yep. yeah. throughout Acts. And this is kind of the, the culmination of that. Yeah, You see other elements of it continue to come up in Acts. And, yeah, now the church has to do something about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But this is kind of the, the culmination of all that tension. Yeah. yeah, and what you saw was Paul presents the idea that the, the Gentiles are being used as um, the Gentiles are being pulled into the, to the fold of God's people. Um, and the Jews are, many of them are not accepting that. Um, and this will go later into Paul's theology in Romans about how Gentiles will be used to make the Jews jealous to bring them back into the fold. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yep. So today's text, Acts 15, one chapter, the first ecumenical council. Woo! Yes. The first council wait, deciding wait, wait. something you for the said, whole church. You just said a big word. What does ecumenical mean? Uh, you're ec- you're an ecumenicist. Yeah, you're an ecumenicalist. Caleb. Like the heresy? Yeah. No. Okay. <laughs> we will get into what ecumenical councils are in a yep. little bit. Okay. Let's get through some of the text and then we'll get into that. Okay. okay. Chapter 15, the Jerusalem council. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised, according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debated with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversation of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers when they came to Jerusalem. They were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them in order them to order them to keep the law of Moses. Okay. Mm. So it's all coming to a head. Paul's friends have followed him. Yeah. Yes. Well, and, and, and <laughs> elsewhere in Acts, this will be a continuing problem. Yes. However, um, what you have here is the leaders Mm -hmm. of the different church are coming together to really to to, to deal with a theological issue that's that threatens the unity of Christ church, Christ body very early on. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Well, and it. It's What's cool deal. is the this council forms not too dissimilar from other councils later on in history where a problem arises, either a heresy or a bad idea that's rising in the church, and the fathers, the group meets to mm-hmm. say, hey, how are we going to deal with this? Because mm-hmm. this is dividing us. Well, and ultimately what's what's being presented in that, unless you be circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you can't mm-hmm. be saved, that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. This is the question is, I'm going to f- frame it a bit. I'm going to couch this 
Mm-hmm. And then you guys can say whether or not. Okay. And you see it represented in Paul's depiction of this problem in Romans and in Galatians yep. and a bit in Ephesians, although less explicitly. Yeah. Galatians is very big. Yes. With this. And we'll, yeah. Um, is the salvation and covenants of Christ a subcategory of the Jewish faith? Mm-hmm. Or is it the fulfillment and superseding? Right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's, I think that's ultimately what's, what's going on here. Yes. Right. And right. where you see Paul land is the promise of a son from Abraham is the context in which Jesus is the fulfillment of the, the pattern and promise of God over time. Mm-hmm. And Moses's law was a subset underneath that. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. And like Caleb, like you're saying, is this, are we to add what Jesus said, add it to the law that already exists? Or is there something about the law that now this, I don't want to say replaces, because that's saying that that doesn't matter anymore, but that some that this new thing, which is fulfillment, if it is, mm-hmm. does the law still matter in that regard? And mm-hmm. I think the answer uh, is, is no, mm-hmm. <laughs> generally. We're, we're going to come up to that. Yep. 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 Um, but generally, what's the the reason why circumcision's elevated to this massive, like mm-hmm. as like the the mm-hmm. how can I say it? The mm, let's just say the flagship argument. Let's mm. just say that is because that's the the mark yep. of a child of God, as according to the covenant, the of, sign of the covenant of Moses. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and not just of that, but actually going as far back as as. Abraham, yep. but it is so closely associated with the Jewish identity of yep. the people of Moses, the people of the covenant of Moses, people who met God on the Mount, on Mount Sinai, who were taken out of Egypt. There's, there's heavy ties there. To be yep. fair, the Bible does put a massive emphasis oh, on it. Oh, it's huge. Yep. Well, it, the, the whole idea is that if to Abraham, if somebody was not circumcised, they would be cut off from the community. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Moses yeah. almost died because he wasn't circumcised. Yeah. Yes. Whatever that means. Yeah. Yeah. That whole story yeah. has its own little interpreta- interpretive, s- um, let's just say, well, it's fraught with its own problems. Yeah. Yeah. Shall I continue? Get to the meat of the story. Sure. Verses 6 to 11. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel, giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test? By placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. Peter learned. Very nice. Yeah. He did it. Mm. Woo. Good job, Peter. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it is great. Mm-hmm. It's his, normally we see um, James getting up, like it, when we talk about the first council of Jerusalem and previously we'll see, we articulate James as kind of that leader figure, but Peter does his job here. Yep. Yep. And it's, and it's, it's also kind of like uh James is really the leader, like he's the leader present in this area, but because of that, and it's still formations out of Jerusalem, he has taken not just both the leadership of this area of being the church in Jerusalem, but realistically, he seems to be holding the leadership of the whole church at this point. Yep. To some degree. Uh, Yeah. Well, especially as a mother church type concept yep. yeah yeah it's also where like you know people are coming out out of jerusalem to preach to the other places too yeah, yeah. what do you guys think of his of peter's comment in uh i think it's yeah verse seven you know that in the early days god made a choice among you the early days i just found that i just found that interesting yeah i have nothing okay yeah 
the I do like the the assertion though that he adds uh the that there's a lot of relationship between the Christian and being an anointed one because mm-hmm. of being mm-hmm. in Christ the anointed one and he says and God who knows the heart um and that is a reference to David yep who gets chosen by God because God knows the heart of men. Um, and he did not discriminate between us and them for he purified their hearts by faith. Yep. Yeah. Then he follows it through in verse 11. But we believe that we believe that we will be saved through grace mm-hmm. just as they will. Grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yep. Also, Whoa. look at what the law did. <laughs> the law kind of, uh, it doesn't suck. It's just it was an impossible standard for us. Why would we try to make them live to that standard too if it's impossible? Mm -hmm. Are we not saved not by that but by these other things? I do find it interesting that in the in the gospels, Christ makes the claim, make uses similar language Mm -hmm. against the Pharisees on the tradition of the elders, right? Yep. Mm. Um, That interpretation of the law. Which is not which is not Moses' law itself, but is rather this righteous um, interpretation and system yeah. of obedience. Talks. Yeah, yeah, this like proto rabbinic. Um, yeah, whatever uh, uh, the traditions in order to in in order to safeguard the law so that people don't follow them, and then Christ referring to that said that. You know, you place yokes upon people. You yep. you tie up heavy burdens. A yoke upon being people. a thing you put on a cow or or donkey to have it pull, or an ox, or an ox to have it pull a cart for you know tread a tread a mill. Is that what they that's called? Yeah, to turn the mill yeah. wheel yeah. if Meals. you don't have a yeah, um, or to pull something in the field to basically to make it work. To, yeah. yeah, yeah. And so it's interesting that Peter here uses that same language. He would yeah. have heard Jesus use that language. Yeah. Um, it also is, well, like we mentioned previously, how there's those like that category distinction between wh- how whether the salvation of Christ is a subsidiary mm-hmm. of you know the law of Moses. Where does this fit in with mm. you know it, almost in like categories type, right? Yep, different branches. Um, in that to apply the the law of a subsection overarching the whole thing would be to turn it turn the the law of a subsection into a burden or yoke. Yeah. Well, yep. and it's the seeing uh what was the what was the purpose of the law to in with God's intention, right? So was the law the ends of the the whole idea of the whole the whole of Judaism? Or was it a yes, means at the end to point. end? Yeah. yeah. Right. Was, was it a, was it the, was it a method and a way of showing God's heart and order and what is good and what is evil and to be sh- like shown righteous before God in the yeah. best way they can be, they can have. Yeah. Because you see God constantly them, you know, fulfilling the law, fulfilling, I say mm-hmm. with air quotes, um, in all the proper ways and God's saying, I don't want the sacrifices. I don't want the, this because you're sinning and there's injustice and there's poverty and there's all these other things that you're not doing, which was the purpose of the law was, was to fix those things. And Moses even himself comments Mm -hmm. on how they have, and he's even talking about the Levites. Yes. The, the, is they still have rebellious hearts. They cannot fulfill the law. Yeah. Well, and early on Moses, God, all of them say, you will fail. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And when you fail, I will remove you from the land. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They haven't even gotten there yet. <laughs> and he's like, I will remove you because you will disobey. Yes. Yeah. Um, Which is why grace? There's an entire episode that could be not just by us, but like books written about how the, uh, I mean, Romans is a good example of how the mm-hmm. law isn't one that leads to life, but one that leads to death. Um, and that this faith is closer to what it, you, it was with Abraham as being shown righteous before God. Yeah. Well, it's, it's Caleb, you're giving me a weird look. Yeah. I'd explore the terms and I don't know if, yeah, 
I would say that it's the law reveals death. Yes. Not leads to. It, it, I think that's Paul's, the argument in Romans. Yeah. It, 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 it reveals. Uh, you, we, you're I saying that's the argument. explicitly in Romans. That's what it says. Is it leads to death? No, that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Leads to. Yeah. It, but his, second, but the second. point in, in Romans is now we're going to argue about a text that we're not, that is not the actual episode. <laughs> I mean, this is just but the point. Of, but the point of Romans is, is also his, his, his comment is yes. Well, the law has done that. Cause I think, I think there's one passage that does articulate what you're talking about. Previously in Romans five, mm-hmm. um, he talks about yet death still reigned while there was no law. And that's, when he's talking about the the line between yep. Adam and and so the law reveals the yeah when there where there was no law there was no uh there was and yet death still reigns yeah right but uh the ch- the argument from ch- uh the end of chapter 1 to the end of chapter 4 is that um with the law comes this knowledge of the things they're doing wrong, which is what puts the responsibility on them. Um, it reveals that, but I don't think it, it causes. Mm-hmm. Sure. Be, I'm, the, I'm just using the argument that Romans is using. I don't think so. I think that's why, that's why I made funny faces because I think it's the, the terms yeah. in which we're correlating the ideas reflect different approaches. The, right. Well, at least from... I think I'm using the actual words from Romans, though. The, I'm not trying to mischaracterize it. 1 Corinthians 15. That's not Romans, buddy. I know that. <laughs> you missed the mark on that But one. it speaks of this same idea. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. Mm-hmm. However, in this discussion, Paul is talking about, again, that the law as a teacher that shows. And because of that opportunity to fail is presented in that revealing, right? In the same way of the 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 tree of the knowledge of good and evil gives the opportunity for disobedience. Mm. It's not that it is powering. It, it's not that it is the cause of sin in the individual, mm-hmm. but it, the, the law's whole purpose is to judge sin, to reveal sin. Yeah. Yes. And it is, it is showing also the people through those kind of examples what God defines as good and evil. Mm. And it is through, and you see Jesus highlighting this and Paul highlighting this, that the, the spirit of the law underlying it is the, is the, 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 the better thing. And you see that in Jesus's description of the Sabbath in talking about how, when someone obeys the written rule of the Sabbath to the point where they no longer rest on the Sabbath is breaking the purpose of the Sabbath law mm-hmm. as written. Mm-hmm. Um, and that if he, this person is not healed on the Sabbath, then they're not able to rest and so heal them. Or you're going to die if you can't get your ox out of the well. So get your ox out of the well. The yeah. whole purpose of the Sabbath is to rest and yeah. that's not rest. Yeah, I think it's it's the the difference between Colton and I on this, I think, mm-hmm. is just what is the what are the terms in which we articulate how the law affects God's covenant people? Cause at least from your terms, my understanding, or at least my interpretation of what you said would be the law causes death. I don't know if I, um, I might just be misinterpreting you. You saying. mean do you? But okay, when I say when I say when the law leads to death, mm-hmm. what I'm trying to say is that is because there is no life found in the law. All it is is a mm-hmm. it's a negative way of dealing with the problem of sin. Okay, um, and that Christ being everlasting life gives a positive and actual fulfilling righteousness that can cover people rather than just the taking away of sins, which humans will always have in them, therefore will always be condemned. If, okay, yeah, if that's what you're saying, okay. Um, I don't think that the law, like, because the law exists, that means that people die or people are condemned because of it. No, but at least some people have argued that the, by entering into the covenant, mm-hmm. God 
specifically puts burdens, actually to use the terminology from our actual text that we're supposed to be talking about, uh, um, God puts the his people mm-hmm. into a relation, in, into a context in which they cannot fulfill, and thus he condemns them to death and rebellion and all that kind of stuff by forcing the law upon them. Mm-hmm. I've heard that argument. Yes. And thus they... Oh, uh, yeah. No, I've, I've heard that argument. Too. Yeah. And yeah. that's... Because this is, this is to Paul's point and Peter's point, which is that the, the... Which Paul gets specifically in Romans more fleshed out, but the whole idea of because it is faith in the promise of Abraham, mm-hmm. given to Abraham, that it was never the law that saved. Yes. The, the law's mm-hmm. purpose by God was not to save. And it every, was to distinguish a people from the surrounding nations. Yeah. And in, to fight against the, the, yeah. the argument that I just put forward too, the law reveals that everybody actually is natively in that place already. Yes. You're not in a, yeah. It's not yeah. that the it's, God puts a covenant on people that they can't fulfill. No. They can't even feel, fulfill the basic moral obligations of existing in God's word, world yes. right now. It's yeah. not the, yeah. Anyway, that's well, what, that's what we I meant all by failed the simple do not eat the fruit problem. Yeah. yeah. And that leads us into the next section. What is the relationship between the law and the Gentiles as defined by the early church apostles? Here we go. Mm-hmm. Verses 12 to 21. And all of the assembly fell silent and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen and I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it. That the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, say the Lord who makes these things known from old. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from what has been strangled, and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he is read read every Sabbath in the synagogues. Okay. Four rules. Mm. I've... I think I've eaten steak with blood in it once. Mm-hmm. Evil. Evil. Not saved. Wait a second. <laughs> Have you ever drank blood? Uh, cups of it? No. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Good. Um, Have you ever eaten meat sacrificed to idols? Because I, no. I most certainly probably have. I, yeah. I know I just said certainly and then probably, but <laughs> I'm pretty sure I probably have. Did you... I went to foreign countries where they they do that a lot. Yeah, but it's okay because Paul says that it's okay if you eat food sacrificed to idols in certain contexts. Then how does that relate to here? (laughs) We're not there yet. Yeah, we'll get there. We'll get there. Yep. Yeah, the the four things. Why these four things? At least as far as I can tell, uh, a lot of it for the um, for the blood thing because there's two that have to do with blood. There's the meat, strang- strangled meat, yep. um, because that fills the body with blood and mm-hmm. the meat with blood. Um, and then, you know, consuming blood itself. The idea of lifeblood in the Old Testament is a c- sort of connection to the soul as far as I can see. Yep. Yeah. And it's this, related to the nephesh. Yeah. And it doesn't have anything to directly do with the law necessarily, even though the law does forbid it mm-hmm. to drink blood and all these things. Um, but rather it, there was this connection to life itself through blood. Do you think that that is what's being said here and why they're continuing on? It's because it goes older than the law as that cultural idea. Yeah. I think all four of those ideas, Mm. essentially mm, what's being presented there, I think is them, the old test, the old, not the old, the, uh, the early church in this case, looking at the old Testament, looking at the law 
and then trying to identify as what Josh has brought up, where there is, we see and we see and understand God's desire for righteousness, mm-hmm. what God's, let's say, moral direction is. And so they look at things like idols, like sexual morality, and like what you're talking about with blood. Um, and they see them as transcending mm-hmm. the Old Testament law. And thus they apply as moral absolutes across time. I think that's what's going on there. But not strictly, as we see later from Paul, not strictly understood as one would necessarily read them. We can get into that. <laughs> hmm. mm-hmm. Well, first, before we cover the especially meat sacrificed idols, because Paul has a direct quote about that in the later book that he wrote later in his life. Yes. Um, sexual immorality. I think that one goes kind of without saying. Yeah, it's pretty obvious. I think the big thing there is that it doesn't specify what kind of sexual immorality. It uses a blanket term about it to say all the things that are sexually immoral. So then, Colton, yeah, if you had to study a, a person that said that uses a blanket term and relies upon the assumed cultural knowledge of the environment that they're talking, mm-hmm. how would you go about understanding what they mean by sexual morality? Because it seems like there's a lot of people in the church that don't know how to answer this question. You want me to be specific with what it's probably saying? No, you don't have to. You just, I just want to, you to lay out the methodology of how one would go, what do they mean by sexual immorality? How to find out? Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, look and study about the, both the early church and what it would have defined. Look at the other books of the Bible and what it defines mm-hmm. as sexually deviant or sexually immoral. And also, you know... And, and tied to that, also what's sexually uh, presented as good. Yes. Yeah. And as also, the counter. Yes, uh, absolutely. Yeah. And at least I don't know exactly what you're trying to, like if I'm, I'm missing the point no, or something. No, you're doing it. But uh, also, especially in the Old Testament, what it talks about when it comes to the sexually immor- immoral. Because yeah. these are the things from the law that are supposed to continue over to Gentiles. Yeah. Is the main point as far as I'm aware. Because if anybody even circumcision isn't included in this. Mm, well that's the that's the actual point of the whole council. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just merely pointing out that it's if you want to understand and you articulated even better than further than mm. I was thinking, so it's good. Um if you want to understand any term mm-hmm. that specifically the Bible, but actually any ancient text, or actually not just ancient, any text Yes. That uses a blanket term that doesn't explicitly say what it is. You should, should you go to research? Oh, understand the view of the people that actually used the term. Yep. Not just some mm-hmm. other random people. Yeah. Because if you're going to study what sexual immorality means mm-hmm. in this text, that doesn't mean you should study what sexual immorality was to Greeks, but study it to first century Jews. Yep. Anyway, I'm going to offer a little they're tangent there. In but. Jerusalem talking mm-hmm. about Jews yeah. for the Gentiles who are going to continue this, this tradition. Yes, just, the Jews specifically. Um, I do think that, you know, looking into the Greeks as well doesn't hurt. That's, it I doesn't. would just look into the, I, I'd say the mm-hmm. law is the easy definitive, definitive well, one. Because what's, what's interesting is certain areas of Greece, this term is still used in reference to things that they did, but still considered immoral. Mm-hmm. Yep. So many of the things that Greece is famous for doing sexually they still considered immoral and would put under this term just didn't stop them from doing it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but not Sometimes. all of them either. Yeah. I don't know. I'm, I'm just merely pointing out on how you do yeah. basic hermeneutics, but people forget about yes. that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, for, for real. Just because it's written in Greek doesn't mean that Greek culture defines the terms. Mm-hmm. Or only Greek culture mm-hmm. defines it. Okay. Like, surely there's going to be some overlap, but yeah. look at, you know, I mean, it's a bunch Ye- of Jews talking about it. You should look at them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If they're the ones who are talking, use their pre-knowledge, their contextual mm-hmm. understanding, which would be heavily impacted by the Old Testament, which is why you should read it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. yep. Um, Moving on from that, the last thing, the meat sacrifice to idols. Yes. First Things- of all, why? Mm-hmm. Like, why that specifically? So, 
specifically, um, as Paul goes on to, and in the Old Testament, um, food rituals bind you to the deity that you were involved yeah. with in their understanding. Right. Um, and so you do not want to, because you are already involved in a food ritual sacrificed to a God, mm. which is communion, which binds you to Christ and God. Because that's how you are made his body is by by partaking his body. That's um, his exact argument. Yeah. Uh, you shall not worship God and another God. Um, and so don't. Mm. However, we also know that as God claims, there is no other God beside me or some other things are not gods, but created beings. Um, and so Paul in Corinthians, uh, first Corinthians eight to 10 goes on a whole three chapter argument stemming from this. Can one eat food sacrificed to idols or not? Uh, and presents yes and no for both arguments. Yep. So how would you, if, uh, actually to just reference what you're, <laughs> what have you read? If someone in your church, a young adult or youth comes yep. up and goes, how does that not prove that there's a contradiction in the Bible? How would you go about answering that? Hmm. I would answer this, that these Christians under this circumstance, all the Gentiles that they are talking to mm. are, this is the Jerusalem council. This is the Jerusalem council yep. are all new Christians. Mm -hmm. They're all brand new. This whole idea, because they're all Gentiles, they're all pagans are themselves weak of faith as Paul would say there, or in other passages, immature okay. that not that they are that, that it could be a stumbling block for them because Paul later on goes into the argument with people that are very mature in their faith saying in arrogance, I know there's no God that this is involved in. I can eat whatever I want. And mm -hmm. Paul says, yes, that is true for you. But when you are around someone who is new to the faith, just out of a pagan religion, don't because it can be a stumbling block to them. And so what I think you see is Paul's making that argument later on. Yep. And right here, all of the Gentiles are new. Yep. Now, let me, yeah, let me keep going if yes. we're allowed. Oh, can I continue? Sorry. Sure. Sorry. I, That's okay. As we discussed earlier with the law, what matters is the spirit of the law, not the law as written. Okay. Both matter, but. Both matter. The, what matters a lot yeah. more is the spirit. Yeah. yeah. Can I, okay. The letter exists to uphold the spirit. I'm yeah. going to railroad us for a second. Okay. Yes. Just bear with me. Do you think that that is the same articulation? that is done talking about life, blood um, stuff that's mentioned in the, the last part, meat that is strangled and blood. Do you think that that's a, because their theological understanding of the relationship between the blood and the soul or the life force, mm -hmm. if you will want to use that term um, with things mm -hmm. and how that is a, um, that exist as a sort God's of God's spirit, yeah. um, giving life to reality. Mm -hmm. Thus, by partaking in strangled meat and drinking of blood, you're there's this, there's the, there's an unholy crossing over of of consuming of things that you shouldn't yeah. necessarily have. Actually, that also is one of the main points with Eucharist stuff. But anyway, that's a point mm -hmm. that we're not going to get into. Um, would you say that kind of what you presented there, where there's this, but for the week of faith with that theological framework. Mm -hmm. That's very important. But for those who aren't in that theological framework, like modern yep. day, and, or they are strong in faith, this does not apply. Um, would you say that? Generally, I would also argue Is the that... the soul found in the lifeblood of... of I think that's what's presupposed in this text, yeah. yeah. Do you think that? I think that's what's presupposed in this text. So so just wait, no, just, do, just do wait. Do you think that the lifeblood is found in I the I don't think so. Soul? Okay. I okay. think that's what's presupposed in this text, though. Yes. No, I, I agree. Yeah. 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 The I would say, generally, don't just drain an animal of its blood and start chugging... Why? ...the blood. Probably... Because it is unwise to go near the line 
um, of the of commands of Christ, it is unwise to test them and go as close as you can. That is true. In um, the same way that it may be unwise to go to a market that yes. only sells meat sacrificed to idols yeah, do exclusively because inquire- of the deals. Yeah. Yes. In first, Corinth, in first Corinthians eight, when he's talking about meat sacrifice mm-hmm. idols, he says, don't inquire where it came from. Yes. Don't try to seek mm-hmm. it out. Yeah. It doesn't and, matter if it has been, if it hasn't, but if you're trying to seek it out, then you're trying to make a point. Yeah. And also the, the other context he brings up is if you were at someone's house mm-hmm. and they're not a Christian and they offer you food, if they don't tell you what it is, it's fine. Yep. If they specifically tell you it was food sacrificed to an idol, refuse to eat it. Mm-hmm. Even if you are the mature faith, right? Because it is a because to them it is a food that sacrifices yeah, and then you're partaking you to a God. in their yeah, yeah. ritual, yeah. yeah. Um, and so in this case with the blood thing, I think don't purposely do that, right? But if you are in like with the like with the Sabbath thing, like with other laws where Jesus heals on certain days, or right, uh, or the they're eating on the Sabbath day, the harvest thing mm-hmm. um, that there are situations and places where the spirit of the law is more important, i.e. God gave us food to eat. And so if you're in a situation where the only food around you is strangled meat. But should I go to, should I go to the keg and order a medium rare steak, triple A steak, <laughs> I'm hungry um, now. <laughs> My medium think, rare steak sounds pretty good right now. I'm going to be honest. Right? <laughs> I know. Um, it's the best steak I've ever had is at the keg. <laughs> yeah. They are a steakhouse. Um, I think it is totally fine. Okay. Because we don't have a presupposition of yeah. that life bro- blood. Yes. Um, yeah. It's theology. Okay. Yep. Last railroad question then. Okay. Yep. Because the strangled and the blood are connected. And that there's a... The hardest one is the last one. Yeah. No, no, no. What? <laughs> Why, if our hermeneutical methodology has been, there are mm-hmm. contexts in which this doesn't apply. I knew yep. this was going to get well, here. This, yeah. Yeah. Of yep. course. We have to ask the question. I was going to bring it up yep. if you did Why is there not a yes. context in which sexual morality is merely a limitation for the, for the weak of faith? The well, only the exception key word there being immorality. Mm-hmm. I will. Uh, can I? Opinion. Can I make an argument? No. This yes. Might, absolutely. There's no immorality. The morality, only immorality exception moral. to this is the exception given by Moses and by Christ. Divorce. You're gonna have to articulate what? that further because that's not e- explicitly clear what you're trying to say. So, <laughs> sorry. Divorce I, I and then remarry. Mm-hmm. in parts is sexually immoral mm-hmm. um uh, i see yeah um in both the law and then when they jesus discusses it in the uh sermon on the mount yep. and they ask him about divorce he says it should never this have happened for you you yeah. shouldn't happen but because of your hard hearts moses allowed it um and i would say that that is the only case of something that would be deemed sexually immoral that would be allowed I have a few edge cases I want to bring up, but I don't think the podcast is a good place to do it. No, no, the, the Bible is explicit. Whereas you see in other, these other three things Mm -hmm. you see throughout the biblical corpus, you see God making exceptions (gasps) for certain situations, but you do not see exceptions for sexual immorality presented in the law. Mm -hmm. I agree. Good job. Colton, can you, give your short answer that you started to give where is sexual immorality oh uh that which is immoral can't be made moral Mm -hmm. so for it really depends what you're talking about and to define what you're talking about you have to look at both what the old testament says is immoral sexually and what the new testament continues with that theme and what they would have thought in the in the culture Mm -hmm. of the day um what is considered sexually immoral in the New Testament? I don't think we should go over every single thing because... I don't think we have to. Yeah. Yeah. It's just... I, so if someone brought up a case, there, there is one case that I think that people do still argue over, and that is, like, what is sexually permitted between a man and a wife? Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. like, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, 
how far can it go before it's now immoral, that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, but I think that is one of those like edge cases that I don't even think the Old Testament is super clear on a lot of the time. Yeah, I I can get I'm gonna present a counter that doesn't get into details, mm-hmm. which is I'm also not getting if the purpose details. of the sexual relationship between a husband and a wife is to mimic the love and the passing on of glory to the to the between the son and the father, us and the everything, that you should be doing it for the betterment of the other, not for your depraved sexual desires. You're you are correct. Yeah, yeah, I just don't know if everyone defines what that is the same. That's the thing. I think I, I think it's like the Greek thing that I mentioned before. Everybody knows it's sexually immoral, but they just do it anyways. Anyway, we're not we're, having we're the all, debate. We're on all right now deciding about how we can talk about this without talking about I don't this. Think do you know we how we talk about, about it? Is we, we go to ch- verse twenty-two. Awesome. Good there call. Go. Good call. <laughs> <laughs> That's that whole discussion Holy. will be. Um, <laughs> That's a great conversation what for you the one hundredth episode. This is your favorite. I love this topic every time we talk about it. It yeah. just makes you so uncomfortable. Caleb brings this up every day. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's not I if you wanted your some, uncomfortableness. Uh, if, if you wanted <laughs> some lore about the second rate saints. Ugh. Ask this question on the uh, ask Please Colton don't. this question Please don't. for the hundredth episode. I hate talking yes. about sex. Verse twenty two <laughs> verse twenty two to twenty nine. <laughs> Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them to send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brothers with the following letters. The brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. Greetings. Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words unsettling your minds, although... We gave them no instruction. It has seemed good to us, having come to one accord, to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. For it was seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no great greater burden than those these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols, and from blood, and from that from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. So then they were sent off. They went down to Antioch and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. And after they had spent some time, they went off in peace by the brothers to the, to those who have, had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. So the letter's a synopsis of the council. Yeah. Right. Yep. And it's the, the passing first. on to the rest of the church. Mm-hmm. This is what the apostles have agreed on. Yeah. It's also the first epistle. Hmm? Right? No, probably not. Oh. Because gen- uh, because um Galatians appears to be written yeah, before. Wow. Okay, you spoiled the fun. But yes, it's the second epistle. <laughs> the funny. epistle to the Antiochians. <laughs> Antiochians. Antiochians. But then that sounds like Antiochus, so it's, it's a little more confusing. Probably Antiochus is named after Antiochus. Epiphanes. Epiphanes. Man, this You're telling sucks. me that the, the 50 hey, different Ant- Antioch cities were named after Antiochus? Are they all within the, the Ptolemaic or the Seleucids? They're all within the same re- general area, so yeah, yeah, probably. So they're probably anyway. all within his governorship. Anyway, um, <laughs> let's let's bring up what let's bring up um, ecumenical councils and just councils in general now, because okay. one of the big things with councils and ecumenical councils, and this one being the first, being you have a gathering of all the elders, mm-hmm. in this case the apostles and the elders. Yep. And then there is like a resolution document, Mm -hmm. right? This is what we've, there's a crisis of faith that's going on. We're going to gather all the big wigs. Yep. As one of our profs from Bible school said, those holy (laughs) old guys. Most holy old guys. Most holy old guys. Yep. The leader of every church in the area. Yep. Or representative of every area. Yep. And then they will, they will debate it and they will come up with a resolution or a document. Not just debate, pray and fast. This is true. Yep. This is true. And I think that's one of the... It's and reflected. punch each other. That's a 
That's a reference to um, St. Nicholas, Saint Nicholas. Who pu- yeah. reportedly, probably, I, probably. I'd go with probably, <laughs> maybe not. I don't know. I probably punched Pelagius. Um, punch, was it Pelagius? I thought it was uh, Arian. Arian. Arius. Yeah. Arius, Pelagius yeah. Pelagius comes later. Yeah. Darth Pelagius. Yeah. Darth Pelagius. No, and so I find it, it it's what you mentioned, Josh, with the yeah. prayer and fasting too. You see it reflected in their letter with the, it seemed good to us and to the Holy Spirit. Yes. And so part of what's being reflected here is that the church does believe Mm -hmm. that the Holy Spirit, that God, by his Holy Spirit working in the church, guides doctrine, guides people to to correct responses to um, crucial issues. Yeah. And it's not new revelation necessarily, specifically when you get outside the New Testament into the early church fathers with the Council of Nicaea and Chalcedon and all that stuff. But the with here, it's not new revelation revelation it's well we are disagreeing about something god has said Mm -hmm. and we don't know how to deal with this because it's not explicitly stated but there is an ethic in the law and in the prophets and in the writings which they would consider the scripture at the time yep and the teachings of christ and we're trying to figure out resolution now my thinking is with prayer and fasting here and with the holy spirit Do you think there's anything in relationship here with the Old Testament idea of being able to ask God anything that we covered in Samuel with like the Uman and Thummim or the Ephod or the other things? I don't think so. Okay. I also at least the idea. Sorry. um, At least the pattern of being able to ask God for resolution. Uh, Yeah, but I I think think that exists trying to align themselves with God's will rather than asking God directly for it they're trying to make sure that they are doing what is in line with god's will yes but they're but they're disagreeing over what is god's will and the whole yeah. point of the prayer and the fasting is to recenter oneself around god yes mm. yeah but there is a petition i, th- I think it's more yeah. it's more petitionary a, sense to yeah it. but i don't know if it's as much as like a it's not direct. God, it's give not, me a yes or no answer yeah. to this question. Yeah. Which was very explicit with David. Yeah. yeah. And so I think it is, it's more about, you know, people discerning. Like, this happens today mm-hmm. all the time with churches, but obviously it's happening on a grand scale here. Or, or And in or, the church councils of Nicaea and Chelston. Mm-hmm. Or is it the idea that there's no longer these, these objects that people use to try to talk with God with? They simply have the Holy Spirit in their hearts. That's the argument. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But I don't think it's as directly connected as, at least here. I I do think that prayer, we can now approach God directly Mm -hmm. um, with our prayers rather than having to ask the priest to do it through the Urim and Thummim or through other means or Or through prophets or prophets and and them praying even. Mm -hmm. Um, I do agree that that is a theme in Mm -hmm. the New Testament as explicit. I don't know if here and even many other places in the New Testament, especially that them praying and fasting is them trying to ask. It is them asking God for guidance, but I don't think it's in the same vein as something like the Urim and Thummim. I, I keep, we keep bringing it up, but see, I can explain what that is. I think the Urim and the Thummim. Uh-huh. Dice. Probably. God dice. Or akin to dice. Yeah. And the drawing straws mm. in the beginning of uh, mm-hmm. Acts. Are more akin. This I'm resurrecting the old debate. Yeah, I was going to say we talked about this in the first episode. Two, it's more akin to divinely sanctioned revelation, uh, divinely divinely sanctioned divination. I'm resurrecting the old debate from Samuel. Uh, kinda. And I think that the Holy Spirit, those because we now have a relationship with. Mm-hmm. God through the Holy Spirit by the work of Christ, the ministry of Christ, um, we can now be guided into all truth by the Holy Spirit. Yeah, they also didn't have the Spirit at that time. So yeah, I don't think that that's we again we we had that argument at yeah. this point. Yeah, and that's now it's evil to draw straws, Colton. Well, n- n- no. Okay, to Take do good. it to definitively say what God is saying is true, I don't think you should do that. Okay. You can't appeal to those such things? I don't think you should. Okay. What if I you think have... I think we have other means to do it. Such as? Prayer. Fasting? And fasting. Okay. 
and profits. And profits. Uh, kinda. Because specifically here, the profits yeah. are related to preaching. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So non-denom pastors are how you decide the will of God. No. Yes. no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just well, as much as priests. So. Yeah. Well, no. I'm glad that we arrived on that because that was what my question was for. Cool. What? So that's why I asked, how does this relate to the Thuman? Anyway, and we said there, no, and then we talked about for ten minutes about why it does. We which is great. We did. We, we said it's about, categorically different. There is something here. They define what is what righteous. is the Christian faith. Yeah, what is the Christian faith? What is righteous for believers to do? Yes, it's the apostles, so they're going to have Jesus's teaching and all that. But this is like, well, there is no explicit mention of God speaking, unlike with the uh, with the vision that Peter has or him talking with the different prophets. Uh, or different uh, disciples that go in like with Paul and unscaling his eyes or with uh, Ananias and Sapphira, like these yeah. different things. This is different. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is not, this is not God's still involved. Obviously, This, this is, is the Holy Spirit working in his church to bring about yeah. correct belief mm-hmm. and safeguard. But correct again, doctrine. but again, this is the, the specific issue was what does it, what does a Gentile need to do? Mm-hmm. And, Paul, Peter started this whole thing off with, no, 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 you're saved by grace and faith. That, that's what you're saved by. You're saved by Christ. This is about holy living. Mm-hmm. This isn't about salvation. Well, here's the thing. Their response mm-hmm. is what you're saying. Yes. Absolutely. Where Paul takes it. Yes. Because where Paul takes it in Romans and especially in Galatians, mm-hmm. which is actually prior to this shows that, well, the, the issue that they're responding to is about righteous living, the roots of which, especially in mm-hmm. Paul's mind, because every time Paul brings it up, it's this yeah. like, it's a different gospel. What are you yes. doing, Peter? Are yeah. you doubting what Christ has done to unify the, like, <laughs> the Gentiles and the, and the Jews? What's wrong with you? And so, like, yeah, that's exactly what he said. He um, does it in Galatians. <laughs> it's very funny. Um, and so, well, the context of the letter is definitely what you're talking about there is like a pastoral righteous living response to to what the Gentiles must do. Mm-hmm. Um, Paul makes it very clear in his context where he's dealing with these issues as a pastor mm. yeah. type person. It does immediately affect salvation problems. Salvation, yes. not, salvation yeah. terms. Are you, Joshua, what you're saying is that these four things are about right living and not like if you mess up these things, your salvation's Correct. at fault. That is why mm. that is... That is, I agree. The Judaizers are pulling people away from the faith. Judaizers, right? yes. But they're talking about, well, how, well, what do we say to the Gentiles that mm-hmm. are coming to the faith? What, how, is, mm-hmm. how is the law and if, stuff related to them? If it's not the Judaizers' answers, answer, yeah. what's the answer? Yeah. yeah. It's this. Yeah. yeah. And so what is the relationship of the law to the people? And it's the like it was in the Old Testament, technically speaking. It's the relationship of the law was about holy living and living l- the in relationship with God as his people, as distinct from others to be holy as he is holy, mm. you're saved by faith. I have two questions. They're both very big questions. So I'm going to answer, mm-hmm. ask one first in case we don't get to the other. This outlines, we talked about it a little bit, ecumenical councils. Mm-hmm. It outlines that idea. First, what is an ecumenical? Like we talked about like the come like believers coming in and the leaders elders of the churches coming together mm-hmm. to answer a yep in some cases an existential threat or at least a almost always yeah a, a a big threat um and what are some of the major ones and why do they matter and what does ecumenical Councils. mean ecumenical yeah. merely means the whole church or the the areas from like right. it's the uni- not just not unified, a regional not council like a regional council would just be like those in, in not just Jerusalem, but Jerusalem and the surrounding area. Mm. So if there's like a common heresy going around Jerusalem, mm-hmm. they'd call a regional council. This is what you see in the early church about certain things. And oftentimes a regional council will be called first, and then it may escalate and escalate and escalate, mm. and then turn into an ecumenical council, which is you have bishops, church leaders, pres- presbyters from all over the church, mm. from everywhere. Like yeah. even in the Council of Nicaea, right, that was held in modern-day Turkey. You have bishops from England, even, Mm -hmm. which is wild 
Yep. Um, the whole Roman like Empire. 5,000 miles away or something this, like that? I yeah. don't know. It was ridiculous. Paid right? by the emperor himself. Yes. <laughs> and so you have, it, it, you gather all the, mm. the, 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 well, the, the elders of the church, right? Yep. Um, to, hey, what, what is the answer to this, to this existential threat, this doctrinal threat? Um, how can we, what is, what seems good to, to us? And to the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Prayer and fasting, debate. Yeah. Lots of debate. Some punching. Yeah. Quite a bit. More than you'd think. The emperor locking you in a room. Yeah. Yeah, that too. <laughs> if you um, want to look at some cool ones. What are the four main ones? Four? Well, there's three main ones. Um, I, I'm adding on the last no, one. No, there's because, seven. <laughs> okay, I know there's there's a lot. There's a lot. Also, every... Because the Roman Catholic Church views itself as yeah. the church except yeah. this is kind of toned down in more recent like nicaea too technically they classify bad, bad every single yeah yeah you the, said nicaea too oh sorry nicaea too has like, its own what, there's a nicaea too there is that's the seventh ecumenical council um oh yeah, yeah um yeah. it's the mary stuff right uh idolatry or not adultery um saints i icons i iconography oh, yeah, that's yeah, the yeah, word yeah. yeah um of which if if you want to do a crash course into some interesting church councils throughout church history. Mm -hmm. Look up the first seven. The major major ones to hit are Nicaea. Of course. Um, Chalcedon. Chalcedon. Council of Ephesus is an interesting mm -hmm. little one there. Mm -hmm. Robbers Council as well. There's some interesting stuff there. And I would say Council of Frankfurt. As well as Nicaea too. Mm. Yep. And, and Trent. Trent as well if you want to get into the yeah, Reformation not, stuff. Not why it's <laughs> good, but why it's... That one's not very. That one's not very good. Council of Frankfurt's awesome. That's there's going to be one. some one person out there that's going to know what that is. Yeah, yeah. And Point it's, being, it's you yeah. and the at these councils, the first three, four, you see the organization of what is the beginnings of the conversation of what is scripture. You see the organization of what is incarnational theology, what is trinitarian theology, uh, what. What does it mean that the son of God is the son of God? Is he a subordinate being or is he equally God yeah. as the father? Would it be unfair to say it's like a, it's not more discover, it's not discovering the faith. It's mm -hmm. not uh, expanding the faith. It's more codifying it. Yeah. Taking what was in the Bible or previously held beliefs in the church from the time of the apostles and then codifying it into rigid, I say rigid, mm -hmm. mostly rigid structures so that people can believe in what we'd call orthodox belief. Yeah, well, what I think... And not fall into heresy. Generally speaking, if I'm allowed to, and Josh mm -hmm. may correct me on this, because he's actually read more books on... <laughs> uh, no. You've read... A, books that you've read is specifically on this. I've read yes. books adjacent to this. Yeah. That would have content on it. Um, the function of the creeds mm -hmm. for... And this comes from a Protestant lens, obviously. Um, is the creeds are a articulation of the faith that is once handed down that is encapsulated in the scriptures mm -hmm. that is believed across all Christian peoples across. Um, that's why ecumenical it is the Catholic faith, small mm -hmm. C, but articulated in a specific response to a problem at that time. And that's right. why, that's why like the Nicene creed, the church creed, um, uses like Neoplatonistic terms, right? Right. A Neoplatonistic is types a of new philosophy, Platonic, like yeah. from new yeah. philo Republic. philosophical terms no. from the Greek philosopher Plato. Yeah, think realm of forms and all that. If you have any idea what that means, yeah. But like, mm -hmm. but it's specifically geared against that problem, yeah. right? And then you have with the the Chalcedonian definition, or some people call it the you have the a new word get made up. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, and then it's like, okay, but some people disagree about how we exactly understand the Nicene yeah. Creed. And so the Chalcedonian definition from the city mm -hmm. of Chalcedon, the Council of Chalcedon, is about, hey. This is what it specifically means what, when it says this. Yeah, this is what we mean by this. And thus, it, it, it does this fine line between two different yeah. categories of heresy. Yeah. And that mm -hmm. one's mostly about the incarnation, right? Yeah. And the Hypos hypostatic union. That's yeah. what it's called. Yeah, and big words. <laughs> what you kind of see is, is that, well, 
for somebody who's like, well, why is this necessary? Right. It's for, for most people, when you read the Bible for, for the apostles who mm-hmm. didn't have these creeds, when they were presenting these ideas, didn't have these distinctions because they didn't need the distinction because the heresy had not arisen, yes. which caused chaos and yep. problems. Right. And you see that in the Jerusalem council of, well, now that there's these people saying that you have to get circumcised, well, that wasn't a problem that they had dealt with up until then. Yep. And that wasn't a problem necessarily that Jesus had spoken of explicitly in the gospel. Mm-hmm. And so when they're having to deal with this, they're like, wow, we don't, what, what, what? Yeah. yeah. What are we doing here? Well, this was never a problem. I never, I never even thought about this up until now. Well, <laughs> think of even like early Gnosticism that's outlined in the Bible as a fair, very early heresy that, you know, all of the church fathers disagreed with Mm -hmm. um, and all of the uh, epistles and apostles Mm -hmm. who talk about epistle apostle um, who talk about it in the Bible, think like Jude or uh, yeah. The the latest epistles deal with it heavily. Yeah, exactly. Um, And it's, it's a new idea at this point. Yep. They just go, Hey, these guys are wrong. And because it's the apostles, really, that's what gives them the authority to say it. But when the apostles aren't there anymore, and you don't have someone who is directly mm-hmm. tied to Christ as like his direct follower. You, you can't just have someone come out and say, this is what it is. You need okay. the consensus of the church, right? Sure. Question for you guys. Yep. Are councils and creeds such as this, which we've talked about, authoritative? What would make them authoritative? Is it because they reference the, what the Bible says, or is it because they themselves hold? I'm asking you guys. So I'm going to give the reform you, answer. You can, you can define authority and what mm. type of authority, but I'm asking. I'm going to give the Protestant reformed answer, okay. which is as long as far as they agree with scripture. Okay. I agree. Um, yeah. And the reason for that is because we would believe in the Protestant discussion that scripture is the last, re, the last and greatest authority given by the Holy Spirit. It is God breathed. It has qualities that other things do not um, directly Mm. empowered by God. Uh, And the creeds are a reflection of the truth presented in scripture. Yep. And definition. Yeah. And codify. That's why I say codify. It codifies ideas in scripture. Mm. Like the Trinity as when the Nicene Creed talks about the Trinity yeah, it's kind of hard to find in the Bible, but you read it and then you look back at the Bible and you're like, oh, actually that makes a lot of sense. But imagine we didn't have that creed and you tried to ask someone, hey, uh, how many gods are there? And they go, well, it's one. It's like, oh yeah, but it just finds the it's, it's like, oh my gosh, what? How, how do I deal with this? The Nicene Creed exists for the reason of simplifying and codifying and orthodoxizing, I don't know, making, <laughs> showing what is right based on what the Bible says. <clears throat> Not and because it itself says something new. Yeah. Um, so, so if someone says, I reject the creeds, they reject Christ. Okay. I mean, the, 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 Hang the, on. the opening statement of the creed says that. Oh, the, 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 <laughs> the Athanasian creed for sure yes. is, is a, yes. both opens and closes with it. But also there's a difference between saying, I reject the authority of the creeds, but I accept everything that they teach. So I think that's important. Yeah. That's an important yeah. distinction because you have small, like you have... You know, Joe Blow's pastor church in the middle of nowhere. That's like, yeah, creeds have no authority, but we also agree with everything that they teach. Yeah. Well, then you, you do have the faith of the apostles. Yeah. In then that it gets sense. into, it gets There's, into, why are you disagreeing with it? Is yeah. it just because it's the Catholic church the, you made it? The word That's not creed, a good yeah. argument because it wasn't the Catholic church. The word creed in Latin also has a specific history that is important to the definition of yep. what is a creed. Right. I'm glad um, you're getting into this. And it has, it comes from the same, the word uh, symbolum or in Greek symbolon, which has to do with the, 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 as written term means uh, thrown or cast together. But it has to do with this idea that when you, it is the creed and the Bible are understood in their time Mm -hmm. as a lock and key. That these two pieces, that one is effective because of the other. Um, That the scripture, and the creeds, the, the creed is the belief, the reduced belief categorized of what the Bible is teaching mm-hmm. and the Bible, you understand the Bible through what is the teaching. 
Um, and so that's why Caleb went with the idea that there was an understanding that this was the, the faith passed down mm -hmm. from the disciples. Um, and so that is why the reformed church says as far as it agrees with scripture, yep. because it is a, it is a lock and key. It is tied to the scripture mm -hmm. that if, that if you hold that as the authoritative piece and that scripture is just loose papers that find their ultimate culmination in the creed, then no, that's, you've seen it wrong that this, these two things play a role together. Mm -hmm. I wholeheartedly agree. <laughs> Second question then, because I agree. Second question. Mm -hmm. Going back to Acts, this council happens. It's defining for the Gentiles and what they must do. Do the Jews still have to follow in the law of Moses? Mm -hmm. I know it's a big question. Um, I would read Romans again and again and again and again and again because it's the word of God. But the I, I believe Paul is in his discussion of the relationship with the law and Israel and the church and all that stuff that you are freed from the law. And mm -hmm. that is why he suggests that those who are Jews, like the, the circumcision is of the circumcision finds its fulfillment in baptism. Um, as he describes in Corinthians um, and that Gentiles need not get circumcised because they are not under the law. And you have been freed from the law as a Jew. And I think his theology yes. in Ephesians mm -hmm. puts forward that there are they are a new covenant community. Yeah, they yes. are neither Jew nor Greek. Yep, yeah, yeah. I mean, that being said, Romans seven to nine is very clear on this, yeah. in my opinion. Mm -hmm. That being said, I think in the early church, in the earliest church, you had a lot of people that still, yeah, followed those. Mm. Um, well, there are mm -hmm. still people today who, yeah, messianic, messianic but, they're, but they're not even. There's a lot of people that are that follow messianic Judaism, quote unquote, and they're not even actually Jews. Yeah, that's just Gentile. You know what? I'm yeah. gonna say it. They're LARPing. Yes. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> yeah. There's that whole thing. Oh man. But the the it's also understandable I mean, I because I agree. But a lot of Judaism, separate from because you've also got to separate um, the moral law from just the civil laws, um, because and there are things in which. Jew, for Jews mm -hmm. is cultural that it is not explicitly law um, and so are you talking about in like Deuteronomy Leviticus numbers stuff like that yes there are some things which are cultural like kosher yes okay interesting because I would say that's more cleanliness and purification stuff more than cultural of, of, of course but I'm saying as because of the whole idea of the law was to distinguish a people from another, from yep. the surrounding nations that yes, they need their, their life is now the being the people of God under Christ, right? The, the tree. Um, but that doesn't mean that the distinctions between cultures are eliminated because you see that in Ezekiel and Isaiah and later in Revelation, you see the people of all tongues, tribes, and nations are brought together under God. It's actually even a big point in the early church in the epistle yeah. to Diognetus. There's a whole section mm -hmm. where it's an early church father book uh, letter. And his whole thing is that Christians do not have any specific language. They do not have any specific yep. dress. Yep. They do not have any specific it's not customs. Yeah. 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 Is it manifests in the culture that it takes place in? What it does have is it has Christ, it has yeah. values, it has a covenant, it is a moral mm. structure. Yeah, and so I think there is no problem with the Jews keeping those those things that are cultural distinctives. But if all of a sudden they're going to say, "But I will not commune with a Gentile," then it's like, ah, well, mm, nope, you're done. Yeah. <laughs> That's not good. And uh, should should they hold? to kosher as a difference that, oh, because I'm kosher, I can't eat with the church potluck? No. <laughs> I don't know if a, if a ethnically Jewish Christian should eat kosher because they want to eat kosher. I think it's more like if you have like cultural recipes that you know and stuff yeah. like that, that's fine. Yeah. But if you're eating kosher to eat kosher, you're doing it for the purification purpose, not for the... Uh, but they can just do it because they like that. 
Sure. Yeah, diet. If, yeah that's cool. Yeah. That's uh, Josh's point. If, if it's a cultural reason, that's fine. But as soon as yeah. it's like a, I won't like what he's saying. I won't go to the church potluck because. Because they're not serving kosher. Then no, that's wrong. Yeah. Right. But I'm also, mm, I also kind of go into the vegans should probably not just be vegan if they're Christian kind of thing. Paul says in Romans that's allowed. Allowed, but it's not good. No, he says it's a disputable matter. Yeah. It's, it's totally fine. But it's also for like cultural reasons as well. It's not yeah. for like mo- justified religious reasons. No, but that, that, that's my point is, is right. that if it's not, if they're eating kosher not for religious purposes, mm-hmm. then it's fine. Okay. Yeah. Because I, I don't think that just because, like, for example, a lot of uh, um, Hindu people are vegans. Mm-hmm. And that's now just the culture of India for, for a vast majority of the, pro- for, for a large percentage of the provinces okay. that I don't think that they have to break, that now they have to eat meat because they're Christians. If they reject meat because they're Indian, is that then bad? No, I'm just saying that if they're, that if they've lived their whole lives as here's, here's vegetarians, the, then they're allowed to stay that way. Here's the thing. I okay. agree, but it's more like, why are they rejecting it? Is it because we, they have this ingrained in them that is a religious value or is it because it's, you know, what they prefer? If it's what they prefer, then I think that's fine. But if it's mm-hmm. because of ingrained religious reasons, you shouldn't, you shouldn't hold those. Yes, but this, this is there, but then you're saying that they should eat meat. Yeah. Whatever system allows... <laughs> which is, which is a forced dietary situation. Whatever, not forcing them to do anything. Whatever system gets samosas to the church potluck, yes. I'm, I'm for. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. 100%. <laughs> I wonder if there's a place I can get samosas this um, late at night. There's only one paragraph left. Yeah, we should read mm-hmm. it so we can finally we read finish it? this podcast. And then we can go eat whatever food we want. Is there a place to get samosas this late? No. <laughs> Sadly, India's no. most wanted is up until one. <gasps> okay, finish the podcast. Okay. <laughs> Verse 36. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now, Barnabas wanted to take with them John, called Mark. But Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated with each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. They got mad. Well, they had a dispute. They had a disagreement. Sharp disagreement. Um, So bad. That they couldn't continue together. They couldn't continue together. Well, here's the thing. It also is, it also is a utility thing too, right? Yeah. Like it's like, fine, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. we'll just split up then. Yeah. Like to me, it feels a little bit like uh, John Wesley and what's his name? George Whitfield, mm-hmm. right? Sure. Well, you know, it's just like, that. fine, we can't. One's more, it's so like 17th century, mm-hmm. uh, 18th century yep. uh, Anglicanism um, stuff and like, a revival, both in Ang- both in England and Scotland, mm-hmm. and uh, both in the British Isles and in their colonies on, in the New World. Um, one is more uh, reformed in his thinking, and the other yeah. is more Armenian, and so that was a distinction. And so, yeah, oh, they probably were a little more vi- a little less mature about it than yes, Paul probably. and Barnabas, yeah. especially because later on you see Paul ask for John Mark. Yep. And he says, mm-hmm. bring John Mark. He is very useful to me. And so yeah. there, there's, there's well, evidence. I'm, in, I'm certain they've forgiven each other. Yeah. There's well, evidence later on in, in the new Testament yeah. where Paul, they, we, I don't think we have evidence of him kind of making up with Barnabas. Yeah. But I, I think that's assumed because he makes up with John yeah. Mark. Here's the other thing. This translation, the ESV also doesn't bring with it, the like oh they don't like each other anymore Mm -hmm. because i like the way it describes john mark is it says now he wanted to take john mark but paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in pamphylia and had not gone to them 
to the work because Paul wants to revisit all of those that they've gone. And he's the way it's kind of depicted here is, is like, well, we should go because we were there Mm -hmm. and I don't want to take somebody that wasn't with us there. Uh, I think what's more important is dessert. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That's as far as I'm aware, that's more what's, that's what's more communicated. Because he had deserted them in Pamphylia yeah. and not continued with them in the work, is what mine says. NIV. But yes. Um, yeah. But the but what's most translations go that way. Yes. That's totally fair. But does what is the what is the con, con, conditions under which he deserted? It doesn't it doesn't get it's explicit. Not, it does seem bad enough that Paul thinks that it's it's going to impede their work in some major way. I think it, I is think it, is it impede or he doesn't have a relationship with the places he's going. I, I, I think it's I a principle thing. I think it's more of a principle thing. And classically that's where the majority of the interpretations have gone. The majority yeah. of translations have emphasized that abandonment thing. Yeah. There may be a side effect of like he wasn't even there when we talked to these people. If we bring him cuz that's what I'm saying. Yeah, like that may yeah. be an aspect of it, but the thrust of it appears to be, hey, when th- when th- we were busy and we yeah. were doing things and the going got cut, got tough, he left. Now, it yeah. might have been for a legitimate reason mm-hmm. yeah. or what we would call legitimate reason. Like, I don't know, his mom died. Yeah. Uh-huh. But based on the context that's given here and from what I can see, based on what other people have talked about, to be fair, I didn't read a commentary mm-hmm. about this specific part. Yeah. Um. It does, in my opinion, seem to be that he's saying that because he abandoned them there, there might be a worry of that maybe happening again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that he does not necessarily, it's not that he doesn't trust John Mark as a good Christian and he's like, oh yeah, he's a bad person. We can't bring him. But more that like, he doesn't seem very trustworthy. We probably shouldn't bring him with us when we're doing this. He's not consistent. When we're, we're being literally stoned nearly yeah. to death in every city we go to, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, he, yeah, it just seems like it, he sees it as a risk that he's not willing to take principally. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to, I don't know. We're going to hesitantly concede. Fair. Because the weight, the weight of evidence is against me though in my heart of hearts, I do feel like we're reading a lot into a single word. That's what the majority of people have read it, so we're fine. Here, high five. Cole. <laughs> we got Cole, We got Josh to concede. I feel good high fiving over this. You know what? <laughs> Disagreeing as believers is this? Is this what's no, going no, no, on? We're allowed. We got Josh. The we I, comedy, I okay? Because Joel's not here, and we well, haven't no, made I'm any also, funny jokes. Also, you and me are <laughs> yeah, on the go. opposite side of a our normal situation. Ooh. Again, oh, this yeah. is the second time. We're mm. yeah. Fair enough. Either way, this is the conclusion of this arc. This and one small yes. arc. Paul and Barnabas' friendships. They they reunited in heaven. I think yes. they reunite later in this, in Acts. I can't remember. <laughs> I don't remember. If they were in Jerusalem at the same time, maybe. Or what's, they avoided each what's other. What's implied, though, is he is John, not John, John yeah, John Mark um, and Paul's relationship is yeah. healed later and good. And so I yeah. think arguably be because of what happened here, um, he probably was talked up as doing well. Well, I think he probably saw how John Mark worked with Barnabas, worked with Barnabas exactly, and yeah. then went, you know what? Fantastic. Yep. Yep. Um, and Silas, otherwise known as Sylvanus. Yep. If you're a, such a cool name. Sylvanus also a villain cool. in villain in uh, world of Warcraft, a female dark elf. <laughs> oh my goodness. You know, I can see the similarities. <laughs> I can see it. <laughs> uh, I didn't even play the game. dude. I was going to say it, that doesn't change what people think. I know. <laughs> dude, we're nerds. They know this. You're a nerd. Dude, Are there dark elves in World of Warcraft? Dude, I thought you, there were night elves. You played Europa. I today. <laughs> yeah. You I don't talk to don't four. Talk to you awesome. being a nerd. I am playing as Prussia. Oh my Hussite God. Prussia. It's awesome. <sighs> oh, that's it's fantastic. So crazy, You're a Nazi dude. sympathizer, aren't you? Holy Whoa. moly. <laughs> Let's end this podcast. Yeah, we're not for them. For podcast. the record. No, he's not. Just for the, the record. <laughs> okay, I'm going to end the podcast before you call me something worse than a Nazi. No, I yeah, said... Yeah, a wearaboo. No, okay. you just like the uniforms. Okay, anyway, Hugo Boss was really good at making uniforms. <sighs> Col- uh, you know what, Kay? So, if you... <laughs> if you have a non-Nazi-related question to ask us... Yes. 
Okay, so well, I'm going to end the podcast, okay? Nazis are the- evil. Oh, my God. Thank Very you. good. Thank you, Josh. Hot take from Josh. <laughs> Caleb also thinks Nazis are evil. That's true. <laughs> He's now talking the truth. Okay. Colton, however. Whoa. Okay, why, what is it with lambasting me every, <laughs> at the end of every episode? I don't get it. What did I do? If you have questions, non-Nazi related, um, send them in to secondratesaints at gmail.com or go to our website, www.secondratesaints.com. And you'll see our chat feature. And uh, just below that chat feature, actually, mm. or it might be above, is a link to our Buy Us a Coffee to help yes. us support or help support us for this podcast. Somewhere near it. I don't remember. Yeah, it's above or below. If there's two buttons. You guys can figure it out there. But on that website, you'll also find links to our other videos as well as our blog and our book reviews mm-hmm. um, with links to some of the books that we do on our What of Our Red section. Um, yeah, email us whatever sort of questions you would like to like us to answer for our 100th episode anniversary. I'm very excited about it. We'll be very good. We've already gotten some of the questions. Josh keeps yawning, but now he's raised his hand. What do you have to comment? Anything. You can ask us anything Please. except Nazi-related oh my questions. Gosh. I might answer some Nazi-related questions. Okay, I'm ending the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> We, we finished the podcast now. Joel, make sure you cut out the Nazi stuff, please. Uh, That's no, fine. leave the Nazi stuff in. It'll be fine. Okay. Here's the thing. I, I really want samosas. Do you know what a night paralysis demon is? Of course. Okay. Do you have to call him Sir Paralysis? <laughs> Sir Mr. <laughs> Dr. Paralysis, Steven. Yeah, he's knighted it all.